I said this yesterday in our, our talk about 3.0 that there was definitely some spirited conversations and the spirit was definitely landing on my head and I was probably a little, little more anxious and spirited than most. And I think that it was an interesting time too, contextually is, you know, we had Black Lives Matter going on. We had a uh, global pandemic. We had a, a lot of states politically that weren't aligning with the values that APA and that APA came out with at the time as well. And so it was a very interesting and sometimes a very difficult conversations to have. But at the same time, like Dave said, that it was very supportive in that process. just heard Aaron Richmond from Metropolitan State University in Denver, Colorado, as part of this psych session special recording at ACT, STP's annual conference on teaching in fall of 2023. Aaron was a member of the Guidelines 3.0 APA Task Force. Eric had a chance to sit down with a few of us who were on that task force, including Aaron and our fearless leader, Jane Hallinan as we talked about a lot of things, including the changes that happened in 3.0, the context in which those changes happened, and uh, what we stuck with. So if you want to take a peek behind the curtain, this is the conversation for you for episode 193 of Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. Psych Sessions is sponsored by W.W. Norton. Are you looking for more activities to promote scientific literacy? ZAPS 3.0 Interactive Labs from W.W. Norton are brief, hands-on activities that invite students to actively participate in the process of psychological research and discovery. Utilizing a consistent five-part framework and incorporating transparent design principles, students experience classic psychological studies like the Stroop Effect, False Memory, the Serial Position Effect, Signal Detection, and more. Once they've completed the experiment, students can compare their data with national data and their own classmates, offering the opportunity for rich in-class or online discussions. Bring the science of psychology to life for your students with ZAPS. For Psych Sessions listeners new to ZAPS, you can try it for free the next time you teach. Just go to siegel.wwnorton.com forward slash psych sessions. And the folks at WW Norton will even integrate it into your LMS for you. That is Siegel like the bird, S-E-A-G-U-L-L dot wwnorton.com forward slash psych sessions. The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by STP. That is the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. That's APA Division 2. You can find them at teachpsych.org. The views or product endorsements expressed do not represent the views, support, or endorsements of STP. Psych Sessions is so grateful to have STP as a long-term supporter. Psych Sessions is proud to partner with Macmillan Learning. At Macmillan Learning Psychology, content matters. And these days, digital content matters more than ever. Macmillan Learning's Achieve elevates interactive teaching and learning with an extraordinary range of online course content in a powerful yet easy to use platform. Interactive eBooks, innovative assessments, engaging videos and activities, helpful instructor resources. Achieve brings it all together and makes it easy for you to find what you need and what you want. See for yourself. Go to macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions for an introductory tour today. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology. Engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. We're here for a very special episode of Psych Sessions. We are here in Portland, Oregon, thanks to ACT and Lindsay Maslin for providing the space. We're always grateful for that. And when I say very special, you know, I say very special at the beginning of almost every episode. A lot. This, okay, thank you. Hey, look, that's Garth. This is Eric speaking. <laughs> This is NPR. This is Eric speaking. <laughs> we're, this is really a very special episode because we have an all-star banner of guests who are going to talk to us about guidelines from the psychology, no, APA guidelines for the psychology major 3.0 and the task force members who are here today. 
We're going to let them introduce themselves, and I think we'll go clockwise. And so that doesn't matter to the people who are listening, but it's a good, important cue to the people who are in the room. And so, and then after they had a chance to introduce themselves, I, I, I have, we're going to go, I have a two-pronged approach to this conversation. They don't know that yet, but I'm going to reveal that yet. So, Garth, would you start off the 3.0? You're not actually here on behalf of Psych Sessions. You're here on behalf of the task force. Yeah, it's a privilege to be involved in this work. Garth Newfeld, Cascadia College. I think that's it for now. And I'm Dave Kreiner, University of Central Missouri. I'm Karen Zahia Knopfel, and I'm at Georgia Southern University. Jane Hallinan, University of West Florida. Aaron Richmond, Metropolitan State University of Denver. Susan Nolan, Seton Hall University in New Jersey. That's the most ser- this is Eric. This is the m- most serious that those five individuals have been, six individuals have been around me in quite some time. So thank th- first off, thank you for taking time to, on this Saturday morning to be here. I I have two angles I want to go, and we don't have to do that, or we can get them out of the way and then and then do something different. I wanted to talk to the six of you here at ACT about the process of revising APA Guidelines 3.0, and because you were all in the, actually you weren't in the room, you were on the Zoom as opposed to in the room, but then also about the outcomes. You know, it's it, it's a big undertaking to take a, an existing document that is a national policy document from the American Psychological Association other people before you had done editing on that. Some c- continued on the c- task force, some were new in the task force, and you've got changes that need to be made. You had some guidance, but you probably came up with new things in the room, I'm sorry, on, on Zoom. You have lots of diversity of opinions in the room. You have people at different stages in your career in the room. You gotta put something together, right? Or, or not, I suppose. So tell me about how that worked and how did you resolve differences of opinion? I mean, not everybody was locked up, but I think that's healthy to have differences. I'm going to shut up now. And tell me about how you, not a lot of people get this opportunity. There's only so many opportunities to serve APA task forces or, you know, APS or PSYCHI or PSYBETA or ACT or NITOP. This is a, you, you all lived in rare air. So maybe tell our listeners about what that was like, if you would. I'm going to point to Jane and ask her to comment on this first, because, Jane, one of the things that happened with Guidelines 3.0 is that just historically it came at a really interesting time in, in, you know, in academia, kind of nationally, and where you live. And Oh, thanks for pointing out that I live in the free state of Florida right off. <laughs> yes. And Eric, let me say that was the longest context I've ever heard you set in psych sessions. So I'm, I may have to ask you, what was the question again? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> All right. So it's a three-part question, and let me give it to you in 12 subparts. <laughs> the, the, to get back to Garth's comment, it did come at a, an interesting time. APA has a policy set by the APA Policy on Policies Committee <laughs> that... No way. They, <laughs> policy on Policies Committee? It's something like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that policies have to be reviewed officially every 10 years to make sure that the policy stays current and reflective of appropriate practice. And so when Guidelines 3.0 came around, the education director at office started asking me questions about individuals from Guidelines 2.0 who would want to continue because the tradition has been that we want to keep some people from the past active to make sure we've got continuity and I help them identify which on the old committee would be willing to continue. And then I realized about, I don't know, a month into the conversation that they were, they, I think they were asking me to chair it again, but they never actually did ask me to chair it. They just assumed I was going to chair it. (laughs) And then volunteers were solicited and we ended up in the opinion of all of us around the table, not having quite the diversity that we wanted. And so we sent out a separate special call to try to make sure that we had broader representation. And the entire process, the reason it was an interesting, especially interesting time, not just because we had to reflect 10 years of change, but it happened during COVID. So normally when people do APA service, you do it in part for the contribution, but you also do it to go to Washington, hang out with cool people, and eat great food, none of which we could do. 
And as far as I'm concerned, APA owes us a banquet at some point for all the work that we did that we weren't able to do. In fact, at ACT, where we are now, this group did a presentation on Guidelines 3.0, and it's the first time that we have physically been together in the entire process. So I think that kind of addresses what Garth was asking. Anybody want to add to that? Susan here, I just want to shout out to our colleagues who aren't here, because we had a, a lot more members than those of us who are here sitting at this table. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm just surprised that Jane didn't get invited to the banquet. I wondered why you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what I wanted to say about the, about the process, I felt safe throughout the process that we could disagree, that we could make our own points, raise opinions. And, and I think it was very productive in terms of how we worked through those issues both because we had a very skilled facilitator in Jane and also because everybody on the group made me feel like it was that type of environment where we could have honest disagreements, discuss it, reach a resolution and move on. Just that kind of group. This is Aaron. That was Dave Kreiner, just by the way. And I actually appreciate what Dave just said. I think that I'll just reiterate and give some examples. I said this yesterday in our, our talk about 3.0 that there was definitely some spirited conversations and the spirit was definitely landing on my head and I was probably a little, little more anxious and spirited than most. And I think that it was an interesting time too, contextually is, you know, we had Black Lives Matter going on. We had a, a global pandemic. We had a, a lot of states politically that weren't aligning with the values that APA and that APA came out with at the time as well. And so it was a very interesting and sometimes a very difficult conversations to have. But at the same time, like Dave said, that it was very supportive in that process. There is something about the fact that most yes, of the Garth, people in that room. This is Garth speaking? Yeah. There, are, there is something about the people in that room have done a lot of service together in a lot of different areas. I couldn't imagine having some of those conversations with strangers. And sometimes I think that we even lack safety on our campus, our own campuses to have really honest conversations about those things. And to be honest, we all come with, we all obviously don't align on all of those issues, right? Just personally or politically or whatever. And so the fact, I, I do just want to say that something worked in this process, the way that the committee was selected in that, you have people from this kind of teaching of psychology world who are good people and good listeners. And I don't know if that's psychology specific or if it's just, you know, when you put a group of people together who like each other. But there is something that's not an easy thing to have those conversations and to move through to recommendations. So just something about that process works just for the future. Whoever our 4.0 team is going to be at a decade from now, it's something to keep in mind that you really do need safe people as part of the com committee as well. This is Karen. And one of the things about the safety is I definitely felt safe in, in who I was in the group with. But there was a moment that I actually just felt so much relief where I could just completely talk freely. And that was when Jean, we were talking about all of these things that we were doing. And Jean drafted principles of operation, like our operating principles and our guiding principles for the process. And I remember sitting there going through as she, they were just bullet points at the time, but it was just going through. And that was when it clicked like, okay, we all have the same goal in mind. We all have the same desire. And now, and that was the moment where I, I felt like just relief in that we could talk about hot topics and feel safe. And we were in a um, good environment because we were all working together and that and outlining that was incredibly important for our decision making. And so I recommend for any task force to have something like that in place ahead of time to help guide discussion. Uh, so Eric here, let me try to follow up on the, this conversation because it's really interesting because I hear that, you know, you've got national, national trends about DEI and other things You've got internal beliefs that you all bring to the table. And I'm guessing you all weren't in the same place exactly, different, different parts of that spectrum of beliefs. And then you've got a document to revise, and you've got to think about the bigger picture of the nation. You've got to think about the council, 
right? Because the council has to approve the revision. So how, I'm interested in how the sausage was made because you're all the people on the Zoom calls. How did you come, to, how, how do you reconcile, and I, I don't want to get into the specific specifics of, some of you might have been overly thrilled that it, it did better than you ever expected, but maybe or maybe a couple people were, wow, this didn't go far enough, or it, it went as far as it could in this context. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I mean, so mm -hmm. how, how do you, you're rep, you know, it's almost like the House of Representatives, and not Senate, please. But it's, you're, you know, you're representatives of the psychology nation, so to speak, and you've got to, you, you're writing this Bill of Rights or this Constitution, this document about undergraduate psychology education that's going to last at least 10 years. How, how do you come up with something in that room that's going to be influential? Susan here. Let me give one example of an area that we did a lot of updating in, and that's open science and sort of the changes in how psychological science is done, the replication crisis slash credibility revolution, whatever you want to call it, et cetera. And we, we had a lot of really interesting discussions about you know, what traditional sorts of ways of doing research are, are perennial, what things do we need to update, how do we balance the two-year indicators with the four-year indicators, and what we really want our students to know. So we had a lot of conversations about which things should be in there, which things we should be more general about, you know, talking about data ethics and things like that without specifying. One of the things that we talked about, I think it was Jane who brought this up at our, 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 our talk yesterday, was the idea of staying away from specific examples so that it's not, oh, here are EG one, two, and three, and have people thinking, I think the way you said it was all of the, all of these and only these. And so that conversation, I think, led to a really, I, I'm really, really happy with the way that open science data ethics and these movements are portrayed in a way. Also, qualitative research is a new thing that is in there as well. We had, we had really great conversations that were spirited, but ultimately, I think, got us to a place that I'm really proud of. This is Jane. I think one thing that helped is some history, the people who were returning ha had some political scar tissue from years past, and so... We knew, for example, that if we began listing isms, ableism, et cetera, that some ism would be left out, and then that would cause a review group to have a conniption fit. And so we drafted what we drafted. We committed to the principle of being generic. And in the review process, which was substantial, I think we had at least two formal sets of review and then some challenges even after the two formal reviews were done. There were people who wanted us to be much more overt about having racism be the primary thing that we dealt with. Like, well, in some ways that would privilege racism compared to other isms, and we had to pay attention to the fact that this is a document that goes across context. So if we, if we kept that operational principle in mind, it made it easier to draft the document, ultimately, even though getting there wasn't always easy. Anybody else want to add anything to that? So let's talk about how, how you see it being implemented across the nation. I mean, it's just kind of rolled out. W when did it formally go public? Jane, again, it was officially approved in August at APA. August of 22. This year. This year. August of 23. It's, it's so, new. So, yeah, it's brand new. Off, it's hot off the presses yes. then. Okay. So it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to permeate. I remember the transition from 1.0 to 2.0. And people were thrilled because, oh, there's not 10 anymore. There's five. Correct. <laughs> it was welcome with open arms. So. Well, and I have to say that this round, the kind of impression I had from people, because 2.0 was so popularly embraced, I mean, it became the backbone for academic program reviews all over the country and a lot of curriculum reform, that <laughs> when people heard, oh, 3.0 is happening, people were going, Why? We have built our entire program on 2.0. Why are you changing this? Well, it's policy at APA that we do this every 10 years. And so it'll be time for you to have another conversation about your curriculum. So I think the rollout that we're looking at this year, the committee has learned that when you volunteer for a committee, 
the work doesn't really stop when the document is approved, that all of us are now committed to multiple presentations at regional conferences, and where whoever will want to talk with us, we are committed to doing that. As well, Dave Kreiner and I are serving as special editors for an issue of STLP that will be focusing on guidelines 3.0 related articles, so that'll be another agenda item. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. Eric here. I've heard that's a pretty good journal, you know. I mean, it's not been around as much as the the old guard, the T.O.P., you know, with that guy editor sitting here, Eric here. So you, so your heads have been in this game much longer than people who are reading about it starting in August. Can we take a peek at what your departments might do with these new guidelines? Or maybe you've been talking with your departments ahead of time. So, so how might you change your day-to-day -day operations knowing that you, what you know about guidelines 3.0? Can we just go around the table and see? How, what would you change knowing what you know now as a sneak peek into the new update? Zarin here. I'm actually very curious. I'm not going to answer the question because I want to hear what Garth says. Because I think, I think it's, and this might be a stereotype or an assumption, I think it's a little easier to apply these guidelines to the four-year institutions and might be a little bit more difficult to apply them to the two-year um, institutions. So I'm really curious to see or hear Garth's uh, answer to this question. Yeah, it's interesting. I Before we gave this presentation, I emailed all the two-year folks on the committee and I just said, what do you want me to represent to folks at ACT when we talk about guidelines 3.0. And a lot of it was what you, you would have expected. It has to do with, like at a state level, articulation agreements. We It has to do with making sure that like the two years are kind of aligned with what the four years are doing, which doesn't always feel great. It feels like we're kind of taking our cues from four-year universities. But I, this is what I personally love about this document is those indicators, they scale really well. And so at my institution, it's really done at a course level where I will take, we will take, my, my one colleague, my one psychology colleague and I will, will use these outcomes to look at our course outcomes and we'll use those indicators specifically to kind of measure where we are, where we're at and what we're aiming for in those classes. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, did you expect something other, other than that, Aaron? Because in fact, from 2.0 to 3.0, we can talk about some of the differences between 2.0 and 3.0, but from, from how we're going to utilize it, I think it kind of remains really looking at those indicators and making sure that they have, they're actionable for what we need to do. That we, we need them to have some utility for, for our courses. And it is interesting at a community college to think about, like most of my students are not psych majors. Like they don't know. When I see them in intro, most of them are not psych majors. And so, you know, I get maybe you know, right, but right before they leave the community college, I might find out that they are working on a transfer to a four year university. And then at that point, I guess that's kind of where it gets a little uh, squishy. Uh, do they have what they need from the community college according to our document? So, no, I, I mean, I think that's this is Aaron again. I, I think that's a great response. One of the, the things that really speaks to a previous question that Eric had was that, you know, what's this process like? And to me, it's a perspective taking task in terms of the group 3.0, because you hear one of APA's requirements for creating these committees is also geographic diversity, not only institution diversity as well. And so you hear disparate programs across the country at the community college level of what they can teach. So for example, there are certain States where they can't teach research methods yep. at the the two-year level. And so I think it's really interesting to hear from a community college level of, of how specifically these these guidelines and maybe even the attributes, and we've talked about the attributes a little bit and yeah, how like those to, how um, those might do that. Yeah. Let me respond to the, the research methods problem and then and then I'd like to hear you talk about attributes a little bit. But the the research methods issue is not forefront for me because it in my state I teach research methods and it's fine. But I know for other people on this task force, it's something that they're really passionate about is how they can use this document to maybe make a case to teach research methods at, at the two-year institution. And so and that just helps our, and the reason is it helps our students. 
because if they are transferring to a four year program, they're late to everything in the major. They're not, they're not in a lab at that point. They don't have any relationships. And if they don't have research methods, by the time they're a junior, this is really problematic for them getting what they need, the experience they need at a four year institution. At least that's my take on it right now. I don't know if that's accurate from your perspective for those of you who take transfer students. I would say that is a huge issue, and that was something that I had hoped to see. This is Karen. As the document moved forward, is help bridging two-year to four-year and providing a more clear pathway for that to occur. I know working on the Committee of Associate Baccalaureate Education, that was one of the big tasks that we tried to undertake when I was while I was on there, and Todd Joseph was one of the leaders on that and is still advocating for the two-year to four-year transfer so students don't get behind. If we And, and, and it's just a, such an important thing to consider because if we wait and allow students to or they can only take research methods in their third year that's a long time long time and so then there's usually a class after that and so then it delays them further and you know they they, they want to graduate and they want to go to grad school and they want to do these things too. Their ability to secure research experience can also be limited as well, which we also talk about as a way to enhance skills and get into graduate school. And so that document, I'm at a four-year institution, but that document, that was something that I personally had hoped to see is building that pathway from two-year to four-year more clearly and being intentional with that. So I at a four-year institution or we at a four-year institution can help those transfers in um, provide that more pathway. Equity was such a big piece of this document. And I think this group dealt with it uh, explicitly in some conversations and you can see it explicitly in the document from place to place. I'll let somebody else speak to that. But I do think that the equity piece here need was also baked into these conversations. So it was more implicit. We're trying to build systems that are more equitable for our mm -hmm. students, especially students at the community college level, underrepresented students, underprepared students. So... So let me, let me let me change gears just a little bit and talk about the pro go back to the process piece. Was there anything that happened that was pleasantly unexpected, or was there something that you were expecting to happen in your task force experience that oh I, th I thought it would go like X but it was Y, or wow this was cool, or huh, all right, whatever. Never going to do this again. This is Eric asking the question, by the way. So, um, Susan here. One of the things I was really excited about was that we reached out to international colleagues and we got them to consult. And what was really interesting is in some cases we, we saw where the, the guidelines are, of course, very U.S. centric. But we were surprised that some people actually, they are used outside of the U.S. In fact, um, I discovered that Hong Kong, for example, has based their guidelines for their country on the APA guidelines 2.0 and hopefully now 3.0. Um, and so that um, informed revisions that we made, but also led us to talk about globalizing, internationalizing here. So that was really fun and exciting. And also, I am in some people in this room are involved in the International Collaboration on Undergraduate Psychology Outcomes, which is coming up with foundational competences for the undergraduate. Well, it's more complicated than just undergraduate. Foundational, whatever foundational level is for your country. And the APA guidelines 2.0 and then 3.0, once there was a draft floating around last fall, was one of the things that informed those. So I thought it was just really exciting that there's now this international discussion that's going on that guidelines 3.0 is a really big part of. Nobody else? I, I would share a process surprise for me that was pleasant. When I'm managing, you know, technically chairing rowdies, they, they were rowdy. They, it was very spirited conversations. Yes, Aaron especially was rowdy. Say more about that, Dr. <laughs> Hallinan. And, I, I am trying to, Eric. <laughs> Oh, that part's getting edited out. I'm telling you that right now. I have full editorial control of my own stuff, too. Our conversations were very broad. They were very deep. They were very challenging. And normally, in the past, when I've been charged with this, I have a career of, of outcome generation. I've been involved with pretty much every APA standard-setting document for the last 30 years. So I, I know I, I've got the capacity to convert things into outcomes, 
out comes your us, my tattoo. Um, but I'm kind of used to scribing as I'm managing. And for this group, I couldn't, I just couldn't. There was just so much going on and so much opinion exchange that it was difficult to keep in mind, here's where we need to go and make sure we get everything. And Aaron, God bless him, stepped in and said, I'll do it for you. And he just, he took, took over the typing so that I was able to lead without the burden of recording. And to his credit, he also faithfully represented what was going on rather than using it as an opportunity to get his way, which frankly is what I do <laughs> when I'm in that situation. So I especially admired that. I would also um, mention that when I would send out to the guardians, that's what I called them in notes that I would send to the guardians, the guardians of psychology, um, that there were reliable people who would respond to me like that. Um, and with high quality stuff and oftentimes that would make me rethink what it was I was asking them to do and so the the level of attention and care was spectacular and I'm, I'm going to do a shout out here to Kreiner who was my A number one like as soon as I hit submit I would have a response from him which I think is just phenomenal responsible leadership and so every person on the committee contributed but the way the committee gelled I've had lots of experiences with groups. I was stunned that we were able to do that in a Zoom situation. Jane, can I ask you, do you think the inability to take notes at the same time you're running things, is that a function of not being face-to-face? -face? I don't know. Okay. I'm, I'm also older, so it might, it might be a sensory motor issue. Sure. Yeah. Okay. But can I, I love the fact that Aaron, Aaron just saw the problem, stepped in, didn't make it an issue, and just said, I'm, I'm going to do this. You know, chill, Jane. I'll take this, and ran with it. So it was really... So thank you for that, Erin. I Am I think... allowed to ask a question of Jane, even though I'm not the interviewer? Okay, so you're all allowed <laughs> to ask and answer any damn thing you want. Dr. Nolan. Um, there are a lot of controversial topics for 3.0. I wonder if there... Because I was not a part of 2.0. I wonder how that differed from 2.0. It was part of the part of the challenge in that there were more controversies that we were dealing with and therefore there were more opinions in the room or maybe it was just different controversies for 2.0. I know you asked it of me, but I can see Eric is poised and ready to answer that. I yield to the leader 2.0. I was on 2.0, but... S sometimes when you do big projects, well, I'm, I haven't had children. I know there's a kind of biological function that when it's over, you, you forget about the pain. <laughs> and, and so, gee, I remember Guidelines 2.0 is not having any conflicts at all, which I know is not true. It, it was, a, it was a, a group that was also highly talented, but we weren't working in the same, we weren't working in the same fishbowl of trouble that this one transpired in. Yeah. And so I, I, I think this clearly had more emotional challenge attached to it than Guidelines 2.0. Would you agree with that, Eric? This is Eric. Yeah, absolutely. We, we did not have the pandemic. We did not have George Floyd. We did not have the DEI uh, heightened awareness. No, we had a hard time deciding what D.C. restaurant we were going to go to. The, it was the, a different time. It was, it was a different time. Yeah. So I'm just proposing that that might have been part of it, too. It's harder to manage yes, the situation. Yes, I think you're right. You have all of these historical within the field and in, within the country and world. I, I think that might have been part of it, too. Aaron here. Thanks, Jane, for that. I think that it, it occurs to me that that was strategically a good idea for both you and me to to scribe while you were talking. So it was kind of like give the annoying little kid a sucker. And so and my ADHD self, it, it probably helped me as well. But I'm kind of curious, too, about I wonder if that function of that process was because previously in 2.0, you were all in one room for X amount of days hammering stuff out. We met for three years <laughs> and we met every other month or every month. And that was, I guess my question to Jane too would be, do you think that hindered or helped the process of revising 3.0? All right. Well, we didn't slave for three years. We, in fact, we did the work in one year, which is all the more remarkable. I think the big difference is you had to gear up for each meeting and we tried to stay true to the idea of limiting the meeting to one hour or 90 minutes. 
And so you really had to be planful about what would you do at this point, this point. And you didn't have to, to do that if you were in person. You, you basically, I mean, I would resonate with what Eric said. You would basically say, well, how much do we want to get done before we go to the restaurant? And then we talk about the restaurant because it was just a, a much more informal, casual circumstance. This was very much more focused. Yeah, Eric here. And we, I mean, we did it in two years, but we had two in two DC meetings, as I recall. And, and, and it was, it, it was, I'm sure it was a different process. And we retained half of the people from 1.0 and there were new people. And I was one of the new people from that was on 2.0. And we broke up into subgroups, and we revised from the 10 original to the 5, and I was on, I think, 4, I think. And so it, it, there were, I, I think there were much fewer challenges. I wasn't, in the, I wasn't on Zoom with all of you, but I think, we had, I think we had it easier. You know, I think that third child is probably harder to deliver than the second, right? The first one was probably the toughest to birth, and then, you know, the middle-born everybody forgets about, and then the third-born's the baby of the family and draws all the damn attention, you know? It's probably okay, and, maybe and the way it goes. and if I can interrupt, for the Guidelines 4.0, I will not be chairing <laughs> Guidelines 4.0. Okay. Ma'am, you weren't going to, you, you thought about it one time not chairing 3.0. That's correct. Oh. <laughs> well, all right, let me explain. Uh, I'm 73. I've been around the block a lot. And I know that because I've been sharing both guidelines 1.0 and 2.0, one of the concerns I had is I didn't want this to be Jane's legacy, is that this is all Jane's stuff, when in fact this is a collaborative effort. And so I think sometimes when you are designated the leader, people just assume that you do all the work and everybody else is, I don't know, doing being on their phones or something while the work is going on, that was ser clearly not the case. So when I was not then officially asked to chair, that was a little confusing. It's like, okay, I'm helping to build this, but are, are you implying that I'm going to be the chair? Should I ask this outright? And then when I finally did clarify it, it crystallized for me, this might be the time when I take on a co-chair or I say, no, it's time to have other people do this, time for other people to have the experience. But in my history, when the blueprint group gathered, I made that decision not to be part of the blueprint group to step aside. And it just killed me knowing that there were people having so much fun and setting direction to psychology. And so that then that weighed against me. And I did seek counsel of loved ones to say, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm not sure this is the right way to go. And because they were pretty persuasive, in part because of where we were, how important it would be to have the continuity that I agreed. And I only kicked myself about that maybe four or five times. <laughs> so the question becomes to the other people in the room outside of Jane, which of the five of you are going to step up and chair guidelines 4.0? Susan here, I'm going on the record as a no. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would love to be on 4.0 if that Works. I mean, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring to be on it and hope that I get picked. But it's I'm just kudos to Jane. It's a, a massive, massive job and a, a massive diplomatic effort and cheerleading effort and just calling us guardians. Little things like that are the kinds of things that make it feel that way. And those are going to be Speaking very of big shoes to fill. Diplomatic effort. Don't you think someone with U.N. experience might be perfectly poised? <laughs> I'm going on record again <laughs> as no. I'm leading the ICUPO. I've had my chance. The international one I mentioned earlier. And I should shout out to Jackie Cranny, who actually was one of our international people who weighed in and also was one of the people who, uh, along with me, embraced including the APA guidelines in our works. So. Well, let me look to Karen and Dave. I mean, <laughs> you've been kind of quiet. This is Karen, and I think Dave would be an excellent chair. <laughs> I agree. This is Susan. I agree. I do too, actually. <laughs> well, this this is Dave, and this is all moving very quickly. <laughs> I and we have it. other and we have other colleagues who yes, are not in this room. We do have other colleagues, but I think I think Dave would be an excellent. I feel a groundswell. <laughs> I'd actually like to hear Dave talk a little bit about some of the things that you you mentioned at yesterday's talk on 3.0 because I thought you or whatever you want to talk about really. I, I just think you have a really good take on what this document means. And some of the changes that were so to put you on the spot. That's Again, exactly what I'm doing. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. This this is Dave on the spot, <laughs> as placed by Garth. So I, I think one of the really important things is 
it's a document to be interpreted. And I think one of, one of the things that I really like about how we approach this document is we had that in mind and we gave a lot of guidance and suggestions about these are some things you might think about. Every program is going to do their own interpretation in their own context. And obviously the guidelines are meant to apply broadly and to give some consistency. But I think the beauty of the guidelines is that each place can think about what's important to them, what they want to start with in terms of implementing the guidelines. And, you know, what, one of the things that it, in my institution, University of Central Missouri, that we've thought about for quite a while with 2.0 is the recognition that most of our majors are not going to graduate school in psychology. They're going into the workforce. We've known that and talked about that for a number of years, but we just didn't know exactly how to do better at helping them. And I think the, the current version will offer some more help to programs like ours. I am really proud of the fact that as a group, we consciously made an effort to bring students on board in that process. So one of the principles Karen mentioned earlier that we had these principles that we operated by was to try to write the outcomes and the indicators in a way that would be accessible to students. And if they're accessible to students, then students should also be able to communicate what it is that they have learned to do to, to you know, potential employers. So that's one of the things I'm the most excited about. It's Jane, I'd like to follow up on that and go back to your earlier question about how we might use them. Because I did run drafts of the guidelines before they were approved through my capstone class. And the assignment that my capstone students have is you take the guidelines, I'm gonna assign you to someone who's working in the field that you aspire to go to, your job is to prove them that you've done this. And at least in the last round that we did, getting feedback from the assessors, these could be pharmacists, they could be teachers, they could be <laughs> this semester, I've got to find a beauty salon owner, matching students to that individual who can help them see the connection between the guidelines and the career that they aspire to. And the feedback that I got from the assessors was, this is such an interesting document. I hadn't thought about things this way. And students also then become articulate in explaining who they are. So there's a very practical use for the document, uh, especially on the, the final leg. This is Aaron. I want to add to that too. This is an idea that I got from Karen and Stacy Spencer. I did something during the same process where in guidelines 3.0, you have goals, outcomes, and indicators that each of end of each goal, you have attributes. And so I actually took the new attributes and had students search Indeed and LinkedIn for jobs using those attributes. Yeah, I, I don't take credit for it. That's a Karen and Stacy idea, which is where all the good ideas that I steal from <laughs> are. And it was phenomenal because I think, and then, you know, part of that process is they all bring two jobs that they found using those attributes. And we, we basically matrix mapped out the experience, the pay, the description, and it was amazing. And they would have never thought to use, I don't think faculty across the, the country or whoever used this document would think to use these things for student purposes, not for assessment purposes. And I think that's a big, big difference. And so just tagging onto that. I love that Karen is smiling right now. <laughs> Karen, that uh, I think, well, maybe you can just speak to what, what were you really excited to get into the document or to help see come to fruition in the document with regards to skills or attributes or those things? So, oh, there's so much. I, so the skills part, because there's a history of, I have some history working with skills. And one of the, that was something that actually came up, came about is just paying attention to the attributes was a really big thing. And I, I remember in 2.0 and reading that and Jean including that in there and talking about like, hey, these are used for resumes. And that actually informed the skillful psychology student document. It was literally taking those attributes that were mentioned in 2.0 and 
mapping them out to what the skills that employers want. So there was a direct link there. Um, but then having that be more intentional in guidelines 3.0, updating the language to, uh, so that they actually match what employers are seeking today, not 10 years ago, uh, was very much intentional. And so it, that was really exciting to see. Uh, additionally, just uh, seeing the um, growth and skills, um, the uh, and uh, the per personal and professional development portion uh, growing was really, really exciting to see. So there is an, and one of the things that I like to do with the APA guidelines is we talk about it being for students, which it is for students. And I, I do that assignment too. <laughs> it's kind of wild how similar it is. But, and then the other thing that I do is I actually show it to members of the community, kind of like Jane does, but in a different context. And it's like, they want to know about teamwork. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we need to hire, you know, a business consultant to come in here and help us with teamwork. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait, look, psychology does this too. We have, like, these are the guidelines for the undergraduate major. And it gives some credibility to our major as well, because not only does our field, you know, we have teams, we have students work in teams, but we have the psychology and fundamental knowledge underlying it that makes this kind of awesome. So that was exciting too. That's really cool. I'm, I'm using it in my capstone seminar. I, I started the mm -hmm. class by having them go through the guidelines and highlight things that they've learned over the course of their psychology major. And then I had them go through the whole syllabus and identify things that they would like to have under their belt by the time this class is over and where they think they might learn them. And then the last couple days of the semester, we're going to have a resume activity and a LinkedIn or other they can pick activity where they have to either put some of the stuff on their resume explicitly if they don't have a LinkedIn or a similar profile, they have to create one and put some of the stuff on it explicitly. So first time I'm trying it, I'm very excited. I, all of this is sort of stolen in bits and pieces from stuff that Karen and others have done. Huge shout out to the skillful psychology student, which I also Thank assigned. <laughs> to and Aaron students. was on it and too. Aaron, Aaron, sure. Kudos. Mm -hmm. I assigned that as well. <laughs> yeah. Lots of ways to use these guidelines. I, I know it's a, this document is, as you said, f for students, but I do think I'm just hearing how broadly or how broad this document can be applied to at an institutional level or like at a, at a department level, at a kind of curriculum level for students, for students going in the workforce, for students going to graduate school, for employers, for the community, for public understanding of what psychology is, it really plays a lot of different roles. It's a, it's a very neat document in that way. So we're coming up on time, and I want to be respectful of your time. I have, I have kind of two more questions in my head, but, you know, Jane will press me on that. I really have 14 more. But I have two more questions, and, and here's the first one. When you take on something like this, I counsel my faculty at Boise State this is a really cool opportunity. What are you going to stop doing so that you can make time to be on a national task force? Can we go around the table quickly and tell me what you all stopped doing in your institution so that you could give the time that this important task force needed to have? Do you know what I'm saying? You can't just add something and just keep doing. I mean, I mean, you can only subtract so much sleep well, in your 24-hour day. So, Susan, I, was, I had been an associate editor of the Psychology Learning and Teaching Journal, which is nothing like being an editor, as multiple people in this room have been, but it's a ton of work. And after seven years as associate editor, I actually stepped down right at the time I was doing this. So that was one thing I explicitly switched off from. Uh, Jane here. I have to say, I, in principle, I agree that when you take on a big job, you should cut back. But in reality, one of the things that higher administrators know is that you always ask people who are busy to do more work because they have the project management skills to be able to accommodate and make appropriate choices. And so I'm guessing that there are people around the table who did not cut back anything. They just figured out, okay, now how am I going to tuck this in? And I'll do it because I know how to get things done. This is Dave again. I would say I did not consciously make that decision about I'm going to stop doing something. I felt like I was at a point in my career where I thought I could contribute something and I wanted to. And so I was very pleased to get the opportunity to be on the task force. It happened to work out that for other reasons, really, at about the same time that the task force geared up, 
I stepped down from being department chair and returned to full-time faculty status. And that definitely made it more manageable for me. But I wouldn't say I made that decision, okay, I'm going to be on the task force. It's time to step down from being chair. It just, it just worked out that way for me. Anybody else? Karen? I don't know if I cut back on anything, it, but I integrated more. So instead of saying like, oh, because of this, I can't work on this. Instead, I saw a lot of paths crossing. And so for the guidelines, for instance, we re revised a lot of the ethics and values sections or ethics section. So now it's values and psychology. And a lot of that work informed some of the stuff that I did with Linda Wolf on ethics and psychology. So it was a nice way to cross paths and integrate and time manage as opposed to like completely eliminate other things in my life. I, I did give up Zumba for a little bit. So, <laughs> so that was one thing that I would have to say that I might have given up during that time, but it was during the pandemic and the gyms were closed. So, but other, other than that, I think that that, that might've been the approach. It's funny that I, I too gave up Zumba to start a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have that in common. All right. So a, a, a serious related question, not my last question. There's different types of diversity. Did you, did you have any assistant professors on your committee? You know, I honestly don't know what people's titles were. It just that there wasn't a hierarchy like that. So no, I don't mean by hierarchy. All right, early in their career, we had in terms of I can tell you in terms of age because again I don't know people's levels. Yeah. But yes, we had a very wide span of, of okay. ages because. I, because I think everyone in this room has the bandwidth where you could take it on and not have to drop something. But as a department chair, when I counsel my new faculty, I always say to them, you can take on that extra committee. You can serve on faculty senate if you want to, but, but you gotta think about what are you gonna right. stop doing? Because I don't want you to get overloaded. All of you are competent enough that you could take on two task forces and not stop anything and get the same amount of sleep and still retain your relationship status. Good for you. Congratulations. But I, but I wonder if, if, if you had asked a few assistant professors, could they have done the same or early in their career? Maybe I'm not, it's not about rank. It's about where you are in your career. And can you absorb a big commitment without shedding other commitments? Is, we is did have question. early career people on the awesome. task force. Yeah. I'm not uh, being critical. I'm just being curious. Well, actually, you're being both, but that's okay. We had early career people. We had people who probably should be retired. We had people who were different. That's staying in. Different orientations. We had, actually, I was referring to me. <laughs> should be retired. A nice save. Yeah. We ha I think we had different blood types. We had, we're from different regions. I mean, we took the diversity element really seriously. We had a uh, disability represented, I'm hearing impaired. So I, I think we covered all the bases. And in fact, in the review process, we did have one challenge that we should document all of our intersectional components to justify what we were putting forward as representative, which I thought was an, a, an absurd suggestion particularly when I knew we had already covered l l practically any, any intersectional characteristic you could talk about. But we did have some early career people there okay. as well. Okay, awesome. So, what advice would each of you give? This is, this is my last question, um, unless your answer has prompted another last question. The penultimate or ultimate, I don't know. It, to, to our colleagues around the nation and perhaps around the world, they see a call come out from APA, APS, some organization establishing a nat national task force. And they see this call, and maybe, maybe they're not an STP insider, maybe they're, but, but they see this really cool thing come out. What advice would you give them if they're thinking about throwing their hat into the ring? What it, you know, having that you've all served on one or more of these opportunities, and they're thinking about it, what would you say to them? This is Garth. I'll start, and this may not be popular, so it might be interesting. We'll see what happens. I would say that if people are completely, at this point in their careers, disconnected from the national work, if they've never done it before, it could be hard to jump into it at this level. One of the things, when I'm looking around this table, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about how many things we have been a part of over the last decade 
and longer. Other task forces, CABE initiatives. I, I, I've worked with you all in many capacities. Jane, you probably worked with almost everybody on that committee in some, one capacity or another over the last few years. And so not only would I say that it's probably a difficult committee to get onto just for a, a person who hasn't been doing work nationally. But I think that, you know, if you want to get involved in national work, you know, it may be difficult to get onto 4.0 as your first kind of application for this sort of work. But get involved at STP, get involved in CABE, get in. It's not like people don't have the talent and skill and ability to do this work. It's just that. When I look around the table, I just see these people have been doing this work for a long time, and that's probably why they were selected. So anyway, that's a thought. And I would add something that my mentor, Bill McKeechee, taught me, which is most people don't live up to their promises, which is a kind of a bleak thing to hear McKeechee say. But he said when it comes to service, if you make promises and keep them, you are going to stand out among the folks who fade and ghost. And so I think recognizing that if you make that commitment, especially if you're in the national spotlight, you really must take that seriously and make it a priority. Susan here. I just want to echo what my colleagues are saying. But if you want to get involved in SDP, the Society for the Teaching of Psychology, a really great way to do it is through the presidential task forces. Each year, the president designates two, three, four areas of interest and recruits people. And these are one-year commitments, although the reality is they sometimes stretch a little bit longer to finish the work. But it's really, really wonderful way to get involved and really see what's going on in STP. And I, I started that way. Garth just said, me too. Aaron raised his hand. And it, once you do that, you sort of understand what SDP has to offer. It's really easy to segue into a longer term committee position, eventually a chair position. And so I, I really strongly encourage you to check it out. On the STP website, teachpsych.org, there's a get involved tab so you can see uh, w what's recruiting. Anybody else want to add anything to that? This is Aaron. This is a really good question. That's a really hard answer for me. I found my place in my career through these opportunities, whether it was the Summit for National Assessment in Psychology, whether it was Intrapsych Initiative. But to really answer your question, I think that on the individual level, you have to look at the privilege that you have and potentially think about not applying to these positions, which is really hard to say publicly but making space for other people to get that opportunity because there are a limited amount of opportunities. And it's, it goes back to this kind of chicken and egg thing, which what you just said, which is, you know, keep your promises. Having that opportunity to make the promise is not always there for everybody. So for me, I think that's, I, I would love for people to do as much as they can and be a hundred percent, but also understand that there is, there's only X amount of spots for people to go and be involved in these things. So that's kind of, that's my perspective on that. Dave, please. I would just add for people who are thinking this, the, a task force like this might be something that they would want to do when that comes around again. Start now because we want people to be working on implementing the 3.0 guidelines. You can make some major contributions, not just to your own program and institution, by diving into 3.0 and figuring out some things about how to implement it. But if you're doing that work over a period of years, I think you're going to be in a position to make some important contributions when we get around to working on 4.0. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I could see someone taking 3.0, implementing in their department, starting to publish in the journals, doing a national survey about saturation and, and implementation, and becoming the 3.0 guru, not on the committee, but then seven years later, all of a sudden, there's talk of a 4.0, and they throw their their name in the their hat, in the, name in the hat, hat in the name, name in the hat, hat and the ring. hat in the ring. There's a hat, a ring, and a name, and then all of a sudden, when they submit their paperwork, they've got 14 publications that, in decent journals, and now they've got a good chance. I think that's great advice. That's great advice. So I'm going to let any of you have the last word. I'm going to wrap it up to be respectful of your time. We've been talking for over an hour, and I really appreciate that. 
Any last thoughts that you want to have? I would just like to ask somebody to comment on the subtitle of the document, which is empowering people to make a difference in their lives and communities. Because I don't think 2.0 had a subtitle like that. It did not. Can you just talk a little bit about that, Jane? Yeah, I think in the beginning, we decided that we needed to have something that would characterize the, the, the temperament of the group and what would be a meta objective. And while it went through God knows how many iterations before we settled on what we wanted, I think the bottom line was we were talking about this as a transformative discipline. And so the spirit of what we did was about transforming things. And that also would be the final comment I'd like to make is my favorite part of the document is the call to action section. So that, yes, we put in place lots of structure to help people make minor decisions, but the call to action is a real request that people go back to the departments and take seriously the big issues and have some conversations about that. Those were hard to write. They were, I think, I'm going to say they were really executed well to represent what the group said, but that's the part I'm proudest of. So two things. I want to thank you all for your time today and sharing your thoughts with our listeners. But more importantly, I want to th seriously thank you for your efforts for 3.0 because you really served 40, 50, 60,000 teachers of psychology and millions of psychology students and hundreds of thousands of psychology majors throughout the United States. Seriously, thank you all. Thank you, Psych Sessions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.